Hi, my name is Dr. John Duyard and welcome to the Life Spa Podcast. And today I want to talk about four things. I want to talk about um, how to get rid of your mental ama. The ama is the mental emotional stress that we carry. I want to talk about the four goals of Ayurveda, the purpose of Ayurveda, and one of the tools of Ayurveda is Ayurvedic cleansing. And I want to talk in particular about how to de-stress your detox. So many of us do Ayurvedic cleanses and seasonal cleanses, which are great, but we oftentimes feel like if we don't do it perfectly, we're not gonna get any benefit. And that is a mistake because Ayurveda cleanses premise themselves on the fact that we want to activate a sim- the, the, the nervous system called the parasympathetic rest and rebuild and rejuvenate and digest nervous system, as opposed to the fight or flight sympathetic nervous system. So when you're doing a drag down endurance event, you know, extreme uh, cleanse that really requires a lot of self, you know, willpower and a lot of hardship, you're pushing the body into a fight or flight reaction. And oftentimes the body, as a result of stress, bounces back and becomes, feels a whole lot better. It recovers from that stress and it becomes a little bit stronger. The Ayurvedic approach is to actually do deep rebuilding and repair and try to make more deep permanent changes. The extreme behavior type cleanses that require perfection and doing everything to the letter and even doing even more extreme fastings and things like that, they're sort of like a rubber band cleanse. You stretch and stretch and you kind of endure the event and then snap it, it comes right back and you find yourself feeling kind of the same toxicity or digestive imbalance or lack of energy or sleep issue that you had prior to the cleanse within a month or two. And the Ayurvedic cleanses, they weren't designed to necessarily clean you out. I mean, cleaning the body out really meant shoveling out the digestive ama, the undigested food that got stored in your fat and you're around your joints, around your organs, and in your brain, uh, sort of like we body will store those things in your attic, your basement, and we do need to shovel that out. That's part of it. That's just the tiniest bit of what an Ayurvedic cleanse is really about. The reason why we use the attic, your basement to stuff all this stuff that wasn't digested properly into those tissues, that's the ultimate question. Sort of. There's even a more important question beyond that. But that question has to do with your digestion the integrity of your intestinal skin, the microbiome that lines your intestinal skin, the lymphatic system, the largest circulatory system of your body that carries your immune system, that is the trash can for all the trash in between your cells and in your joints. And it's also the delivery system for fat as baseline energy. So when we do an Ayurvedic cleanse, we wanna reboot the digestive strength, the coordinated effort of the stomach making acid, liver making bile, pancreatic and duodenal enzymes all doing their job. We want to make sure the intestinal skin is healthy, has the right environment to support the right bugs in the right season, right? We want to support a healthy lymphatic system and make sure your liver, which is the big kind of detoxifier in the body, has been properly flushed, cleaned, and rebuilt and rejuvenated. But then you've got to even ask the very next question after that. What caused all this to happen? And we know that there's a bi-directional pathway between your brain and your gut and your gut and your brain, right? So if you're stressed out in your brain, you're gonna get stressed out bugs in your gut. If you have a really, really bad diet, that's gonna create opportunistic bacteria in your gut that are gonna create certain neurotransmitters or the lack thereof that are gonna have an impact on your mind, your mood, your sleep, your mental focus, and your energy. So it's bi-directional. So if you eat really yucky food, bad food, processed food, junk food, non-organic food, you're gonna set yourself yourself up for some mood-related issues, and the same thing if you had a lot of emotional trauma or you're under a huge amount of stress. Every one of us know that when you have a huge stressor in your life, you just feel bad everywhere, and that is the the brain-gut connection. And from there, we take even, so that has to be addressed, and that's what we talk about as Ayurvedic psychology. You know, what what is the purpose of Ayurveda? Ayur means life, Veda means truth. So it means what is the real purpose of Ayurveda is the truth of your life. You're letting the who you truly are out. And in the name of being protected from the survival stress, the, 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 even the environmental stress and the physical stress and the personality traits that we had to muster as young kids and navigate our family and childhoods, we end up as adults projecting these protective patterns of behavior on the screen. 
and that becomes kind of our personality. We have figured out that if I do this version of me, everybody's going to like me, or I'm going to be able to be a little bit more safe and secure. And as a result of that, we end up projecting that on the screen for sometimes a lifetime. And Ayurveda knew what the science has recently just told us is that 95% of the things that we think and say and do as adults come from impressions experienced in the first six years of life. So those first six years of life, we sort of mold that, that baseline personality. Am I a pleaser? Am I a perfectionist? Am I, you know, a rebel? You know, what kind of version of myself have I mustered to make me kind of feel safer in this experience of life that I'm living. And if we continue to do that as an adult, we end up doing a version of ourselves which is simply not us. So we want people to like us based on a version of ourselves that we conjure up to think that they're all gonna like us and oftentimes they don't get it because we know from the science that our heart has rhythms and they connect with other people's hearts and, they, and we connect on a rhythmical entrainment basis. And when you're doing you fully, letting who you truly are out, they get you, they feel you, they connect with you at a much deeper level. Remember the studies I've talked about in the past where they gave one group of people gave a gift in a hedonistic way where they're expecting something in return. Other group gave a gift in a eudaimonic way where they had nothing ex ex expected. They didn't want anything in return. It was just for the love of the giving. And when they gave it for the love of the giving, it had a positive effect on the genetic code. It changed them genetically. Where it had, when, when you gave eudaimonically, it had a negative effect on the genetic code, which means that when you're doing you, really you, people can tell it's you. And they feel safe because it's really you. But if you're doing a version of you that you think they're gonna like, but it isn't really you, it has a negative effect on their genetic code, which means they don't get you. They don't feel you, they don't feel safe around you, so therefore, they, we don't have that real deep connection. So a lot of us just don't feel safe enough to let who we are out or be ourselves. We wanna to try to be like everybody else and sort of be cool, and, and we have a whole culture of marketing and business and capitalism all based on you know, trying to you know, motivate us to buy the next best thing to get us to feel safe and secure and fit in and all that. And Ayurveda was like, that's not really what we're here to do on this planet. We're here to do the Ayurvedic thing. The Ayurveda is the Ayurveda of you, the, the, the truth of your life. And that's what uh, we're talking about when we talk about getting rid of mental amas, to have a clearer sense of the truth and the non-truth and then take action for the truth. The Purush, the, the four goals of life we're gonna talk about here in a minute. The purpose of life is to do the truth of you. And, you know, and then of course, when you do an Ayurvedic cleanse, the whole point of cleaning out the physiology, dumping a lot of mental ama, being in a really calm, relaxed, still environment where you kind of dial down the intensity, the work, the exercise, and take a break. You know, get off the grid for a week or four days or whatever it might be, or a couple of weeks if you do some of our longer cleanses, and really give your body a chance to rest. And when you give your body a chance to rest, amazing things happen. And I can tell you personal stories about that. When I wrote my first book, Body, Mind, and Sport, uh, the last chapter of that book is called Jet Fuel. And it's all about how I went from being a um, mediocre triathlete back in the early 1980s to being able to compete at a professional level and, and compete in some of these uh, triathlons back in the South Bay in Los Angeles where I went to school. And I went to an Ayurvedic uh, consultation. It was one of my first, well, not consultation, but it was a lecture. And, and it was one of my first lectures about Ayurveda. And I was listening to this guy speak. And afterward, I was like, wow. And I was at that point training for an Ironman. So I went up to the guy afterwards and I said, so what does Ayurveda say about like training for an Ironman? And he goes, well, what is an Ironman? And, uh, and he was an Indian guy. So obviously he probably didn't know. This was early in the, iron, in the triathlon days. And uh, he said, I told him what it was. And, and I said, it's a two and a half mile swim, 112 mile bike, and a 26 mile run. And he looked at me and he said, why are you doing that? And I sort of looked at him and I was like, well, I don't really know. I'm not really sure why I would, I, I just can do it. That's why I would do it, because I, I can. And, uh, and I didn't have a good answer. And he looked at me and he goes, um, like I was an idiot. And then he said, uh, do you meditate? And I said, yeah, actually I do. So I felt comfortable, you know, something I was doing something good. And he said, and he goes, do you sleep while you meditate? 
I said, yeah, absolutely. I get the deepest sleep when I meditate. I, you know, I just conk out and I wake up feeling super refreshed and it's great. I love it. And he goes, meditation is different than sleep. And when you sleep, you're sleeping. Meditation is what we call restful alertness, where the mind, the body is resting, but the mind is alert. I'm going like, oh, I don't get that. I'm a, I'm, um, my body is resting. My mind is resting. In fact, I'm completely conked out. And he said, well, that means you're exhausted. And, you know, I was training and training and training, running crazy amounts of run, you know, miles back then because I was also doing ultra endurance races and training for that as well. So it was just a lot. And he, and, um, he said, you're just exhausted. So, you know, I said, so that means like if I can meditate and stay alert and be restfully alert, then I can do all this training and it's going to be okay. And he sort of looked at me like, yeah, sure, get out of here, you know. But I sort of took that like, okay, I get that. You know, if I can actually maintain a meditation, not conk out, that means I'm not physically exhausted. I'm not borrowing from Peter to pay Paul to make this happen. And I'm not going to be a mess in 20, 30 years because I did care about the future. You know, I thought all this stuff would be good for you. So I started going to meditation retreats and um, where I would just do meditate and yoga for like a weekend, nothing else. And they didn't even want you to barely go for a walk. No running, no exercise, no nothing, which was really hard. Um, and if you're, you know, an athlete, you get that. It's like hard to just turn it off. And then I went for a two-week uh, meditation course and where I just did nothing for two weeks, which was really hard. I mean, I was going out of my mind. But just did yoga, breathe, yoga, yoga, breathe, meditate, yoga, breathe, meditate, yoga, breathe, meditate, and eat and sleep. And that was it. We did all day for two weeks. And vegetarian diet and it was kind of amazing so i came back from that and i can tell you story after story but i'll just tell you a couple you know when i came back from that all of a sudden i used to train with this guy a dear friend of mine he was like a, a olympic uh, you know trial volleyball player incredibly brilliant incredible athlete and uh, he's so much better of an athlete than i was and we would ho- i would we'd work out together we'd hop up these bleachers on one leg and then exhaust one leg and then hop up on the blue on the other leg and exhaust leg. And I was not a good jumper and he was a big, huge jumper. And I got back from this retreat and I started, we went to the gym and I started jumping these bleachers with one leg and I couldn't exhaust my right leg. I mean, I just, he was, they, all the guys I was working at, they had already done their right and left leg. I was still working on my right leg and I, could, I couldn't, I, I just couldn't. I was, just could have gone there all day long. And it was, I, I don't know, and they looked at me like, what are you doing? Because they, you know, they were like, like, are you kidding me? Because I was flying up these bleachers, and I was like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't know. I didn't have any idea. But I felt super clear in school. I was doing my internship at that time, and I was just like knocking it out of the park in my internship. I could manage like three or four patients at the same time and totally know where they're at in different rooms under different therapies and all that. You probably don't need to hear all this, but the point being is that I realized that I was like functioning, I call it the eye of the hurricane now. I was functioning in the eye, the calm, and all this stuff was going around me, but I wasn't a part of that anymore. I had dipped my cloth in this dye of calm, and I had become calm. And um, when I started, you know, I think my next triathlon was a week or two away, and I placed, I think I got a medal or third or fourth place in my age group for when I was like 25 or something at that time. So that was... uh, really good in South Bay at that point in time. And I went from being sort of a mediocre triathlete to being like competitive, very competitive, in fact, and um, and found that I was training significantly less to maintain my, my state of restful alertness during my meditation. And that, you know, that's why I wrote the book Body, Mind, and Sport, my first book about, where about nose breathing versus mouth breathing, the benefits of nose breathing and mouth breathing, and the benefits of pulling back the bow, activating a level of composure and calm, and then taking action from that composure of calm, from that eye of the hurricane, which I personally experienced so dramatically. And, then I, that, I, and I, that made me kind of want to learn more about the runner's high and the zone and all those kinds of experience that athletes seek, my best races, my my easiest race when Billie Jean King, who did the forward to my book, she said, I would transport myself beyond the turmoil of the court to a place of total peace and calm. I wanted that. You know, that, that, that slow motion when the baseballs are coming, they look like, like uh, you know, big balloons coming or, and, and you, just, you, you just can't fail. And that, that incredible experience of, of 
uh, total coordination, mind-body coordination. And uh, so we did research on all that, we ended up publishing studies on the brainwave patterns that we did, and that was my book, Body, Mind, and Sport, and sort of got me here today. But the whole point of that was that I realized that less was more, and you have to train yourself to be the eye of the storm. You have to be the calm. And everything in nature, whether it be a sun with planets spinning around it or an electron with electrons spinning around it, or with the runner's high being calm in the midst of the activity, or being you know, a pianist and, and playing in the zone and you're just killing it, you, but you're not thinking about it, you're just, you're just running with it. That's what our potential is. Not thinking, but just feeling and letting it flow. You know, they call it the flow state, right? And that comes from turning down the dial, getting more rest, pulling back the bow, and doing Ayurvedic cleanses as an opportunity for all of us, whether it be a four day or a seven day or a 14 day Ayurvedic cleanse, to do those cleanses and pull back the bow and establish that what Ayurveda calls being or consciousness or self-awareness and then take action from that place. That has been my mantra from the very beginning of my professional career, from those days when I was back in, in school and I learned that lesson doing my training. And when you tie that to you know, seasonal changes, which is what Ayurveda calls, calls Ritu Sandhi, the change of the seasons, and Ayurveda says that those changes of the seasons are when disease takes place. And, that, and the reason why disease takes, takes hold at that time is because the accumulation of, say, winter, which is cold and dry, which dries you out and produces a bunch of reactive mucus because your intestines and mucus membranes are so dry. Then you go into the spring, which is wet and rainy and muddy, and now you're making more mucus anyway, but you have excessive mucus because you got dried out in the winter because you didn't eat the nuts and the seeds and the warm, heavy soups and stews of the winter that nature provided. You're eating like cold ice cream or whatever. You see, everything in nature is tied to these beautiful rhythms, and we have to balance within them. And when you are in those rhythms, you go downstream with the current, and life is easy, and you're still, you're in the eye of the storm, but our culture goes against the grain. And these Ayurveda cleanses are ways to reset yourself in rhythm with the natural cycles. That's what they're about. And if you get really good at bringing your body into rhythm, you get to also become in that stillness, right? You become more self-aware. And when you become more self-aware, well, you become more clear of what's true, what's real, and what's not real. But if your body's toxic, it's hard to see the forest through the trees, right? You can't because you're just toxic. So everybody said, well, let's detoxify you. Let's clean out all the junk from the attic or the basement. Let's reboot your ability to digest and detoxify so you don't shovel it right back in as soon as we're done, which is those fight or flight sympathetic cleanses I talked about, which are generally you know, not so good because they're like a rubber band, you feel good, and then boom, you snap back. And before I got into Ayurveda, the story I told you, I did a whole bunch of fasting with Paul Bragg, I did a whole bunch of Ayurveda uh, of, uh, intestinal cleansing with uh, Bernard Jensen. I was really into that. And I felt I was a cleansing casually. If I wasn't fasting or I wasn't doing some stillium husk, bentonite clay detox, I didn't feel quite right. And I wasn't unhealthy to start with, really. I was young, you know, 1920 when I started all that. So it's sort of like I got that you got to be kind and gentle. We underestimate the power of being still and being silent and getting rest. And the value of understanding what's happening in nature from one season to the next and taking advantage of that. And Ayurveda said you can do these Ayurveda cleanses to take advantage of shoveling out the, 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 the accumulation of the end of one season and prepare for the beginning of the next season without having the accumulation of one quality like coldness and dryness build up and accumulate into the springtime, uh, which is wet and rainy. Now you would think nature provides uh, you know, cold and dry winter, and that the antidote to the cold and dry winter was a wet and muddy spring. That's perfect. Nature had it wired. If we eat what nature provides as the harvest for that season. So in the winter, it's cold and dry. It gives us nuts and seeds and grains and soups and stews, a higher protein, higher fat kind of diet. And that would be the antidote, like the squirrels eat nuts for that season. So you go into the next season in balance. But we don't do that anymore. We end up with, you know, we're eating cold and foods and, you know, cold beers and cold things and, and 
foods that are more mucousy and pastas and things like that and, and things like uh, that are heavier that, that may aggravate the vata or the winter qualities, the cold dry qualities that aggravate the intestinal lining, produce more mucus, and now you're producing more mucus before you even get into the waning muddy season, the mucus making season, and then you start to stack the qualities, right? And I've written a lot of articles about that, and there's kind of really amazing research to understand how the seasons link from one to the next in perfect balance, and how the harvest of one season to the next provides that perfect balance, <coughs> excuse me, while you're in that season. We have a, a three-season diet eating guide we published for free, um, which my second book was called The Three-Season Diet, understanding that winter and summer and spring are harvest times. Fall and winter, summer and spring are the three harvests in nature. There's four seasons, one always takes a rest, and we need to align ourselves with those harvests the very best we can. And that's what Ayurveda uh, talks about and how important that is. But it's all about becoming, getting into rhythm, right? But the big but, the, but the, and, then, and then we go into these cleanses, you know, and we become so um, stressed about them. We become, we want to be so perfect when we do them that we become more extreme and create so much stress that's unnecessary. And in fact, can sometimes undermine our success, undermine the success that allows you to really, um, really get the, ma the, the major benefit, which includes the shovel out the toxins from the storage sites, your attic or your basement, your joints, your tissues, your fat, your brain, reboot your upper digestion, coordinate that, make sure your stomach acid, bile, pancreatic, duodenal enzymes are all coordinated and functioning optimally. It's your first line of defense is when you put stuff in your mouth, that's gotta get broken down properly. The intestinal lining has to be healthy, not too wet, not too dry, can't be constipated or loose, it's gotta be just right. And that provides an environment for the good bacteria to give you gut immunity, and the whole gut-brain-brain-gut connection is critical. And from there, you have the lymph on the outside of your gut, which is not only the trash removal system, it's your immune system and the delivery of energy. And then from there, it is, um, you, we have you know, a level of clarity and physiological balance. And if you begin to start to live life in sync with nature, you don't accumulate all these imbalances, you stay in balance and you stay in a, a level of clarity, a level of neurological calm, that eye of the storm. And in that eye of the storm, you get to be able to be more, more self-aware, self-aware of, the, of the, the purposes of Ayurveda, the four goals of life from the Ayurvedic perspective, which I think is a beautiful, beautiful concept. You know, we, we get to raise our vibration by getting rid of all the trash and getting the body to work optimally, living in sync downstream with the natural cycles of nature, that's Nobel Prize winning science called circadian rhythms, right? All of a sudden, you're not needing the Snickers bars, you're not needing all the alcohol, you're not needing the caffeine, you're not needing all the things and the vices that we seem to need to get through a day. Life becomes sort of like going downstream. And we begin to have more clarity. Then your meditation, your yoga, your breathing, your meditation, they're not stress reduction techniques. Your life is a stress reduction technique, right? The birds in the forest, you know, the geese that fly around everywhere, you know, they're not stressed out about it. Half the time they're flying around in circles. They end up getting where they're supposed to go, obviously, but it's not like they're like beelining it to the south because here they fly every which way. I go, I don't know if they really got their compass on right. But they're super chill about life, and life is not this big major stress, this big major struggle. When you go into nature and you go into the woods and you walk through the forest, we know there's health benefits when you do that. The peace and the calm of nature is where we came from, right? When you think about the peace and the calm of being in nature, the stillness, you know, before we had cities and civilization, which wasn't that long ago, we were entrained with those rhythms in a really major way. So we were very connected to the silence, which allows us to have that natural state of awareness, self-awareness, that eye of the storm. And the bigger the calm, the more powerful the winds and the more productive we can be as a human being. I really believe that because I experienced that going from a lousy triathlete to a competitive one just by getting the rest and pulling back the bow. 
And everything in Ayurveda, like I'm talking about, going downstream with the rhythms, living in sync with the natural cycles, doing yoga, breathing and meditation, all these things support that eye of the storm, making it bigger. Cleanses during the transition of the seasons. What is what Ayurveda recommended thousands of years ago, before everything was toxic, they recommend doing seasonal cleanses to shovel out the accumulation of the prior season and prepare for the next. That transition had to be smooth so you didn't accumulate any end of summer heat of hot and dryness into, a, into winter, which is cold and dry. So you end up from hot and dry in the summer to cold and dry in the winter, and the dryness accumulates. So now you're going into the winter, your intestines dry out, your skin dries out, which we know happens. Our sinuses dry out, our respiratory tract dries out, our intestines dry out, we get constipated. When you're dried out, your immune system's compromised. And that's called gut immunity, which is 70% of your immune response, your gut immunity, right? So, so nature had a plan, and it seems so incredibly logical to me that we should understand the big picture, the big plan that nature had. And it included doing seasonal detox. You know, it really did. And you can do a lot of that, which is changing your diet from season to season, and we provide those recipes and grocery lists and superfoods for every month of the year for free based on my three season diet book, which was my second book that I wrote because I wanted people to get how important it was to be eating in sync with, with nature. And now we know, which is crazy, that the bugs in the soil are just as important, who attach to the foods you eat, that are just as important as the foods you eat. You eat your spinach, well that's really good. It has a lot of iron in it, it's a lot of greens in it. But what's on that spinach, if you don't spray it, is a bunch of microbes that are synergistically potentizing, amping up, activating the benefit of that plant. And we get that seasonally. The bugs in the gut should change from one season to the next. That's Stanford study from the Tanzania Hadza tribe that they did. They know that the bugs in the gut should change from season to season. That's, I've written about that. This is all part of these beautiful rhythms. And we know the benefit of, of, of doing seasonal detox, which includes, you know, um, you know, the Ayurvedic techniques of using ghee, which is the highest source of butyric acid on the planet which is the number one fatty acid for healing your intestinal skin and lining, feeding the microbes and helping the cells of your colon do their job. It's a short list. We give kitchery in your gut and there's ways to get around it. If you can't digest grains, there's ways to navigate around that. Um, but kitchery is baby food in Ayurveda. You know, we've gotten so out of whack in our digestive ability, we can't even eat kitchery anymore, which is amazing, really, because it's what we give to people who are in the hospital, you know, mostly dead, you know, trying to hang in there, we give them baby food, kitchery food. Um, so the healing of the intestinal lining and the intestinal skin and supporting the microbiome in the intestinal tract is critical. And that happens during the, the what's called the Ritu Sandhi, the change of seasons from one season to the next. During that seven days before and seven days after, that window is when the rubber meets the road. And it's so important for us to do some type of cleanse during those seasonal transitions, otherwise we end up accumulating. And that, what Ayurveda said thousands of years ago, that is when disease takes its first foothold, is during the change of seasons, which is why it's so critical to do it. But then again, if we go do something like, you know, um, do these cleanses and we get so rigid and so intense and so focused to do it right, you know, obviously all for the right reasons, and we become so intense that we put so much stress on ourselves, if we do one thing wrong, we think, oh my God, you know, I, I've ruined the entire thing. I think it's really, really important. I, I can tell you, when I went on my two-week retreat that I had this amazing experience from, I did. I've never probably said this publicly before, but I did go on a run during, through the woods. It was in the Redwoods in California. I just had to, you know, and uh, I didn't push it, but, it would, but I just had to. So I cheated, and it worked amazing. My point being is that you get to cheat a little bit. It's okay. More importantly, is not looking for ways to cheat, but really the idea is, is do you. You know, the best you can is good enough. We're, we're good for that. You know, when I design these cleanses, I know, I've been in practice since 1984. I know that when I tell people to do stuff, they're not gonna do everything I say, I, I, you know? And I've learned over the years not to overwhelm people the best I can. And in the cleanse, you know, I, I built in a few buffers. So if you don't do everything, you know, um, it's going to be okay. You're still going to get the benefit. And in fact, you know, that cleanse is, is, you know, anybody can do these cleanses. They're sort of, you know, an off-the-shelf kind of a thing. So they, they have to be modified 
by you for you as an individual. So if you're going to do a Clarivated cleanse, like our short home cleanse, which is a free ebook, download it for free, do it right off the cleanse, doesn't cost you anything, it's all for free. You know, you might feel like, God, oh, I don't really need to do, I don't, I don't feel comfortable doing any herbs. Well, don't do the herbs, just do the rest of it. You know what I mean? Um, you can adjust the doshas of the ghee to make it, or do olive oil if ghee is something that you don't tolerate. We have a lot of wiggle room to make it fit just for you to make sure you still get the benefit of a seasonal transitional cleanse to shovel out the impurities that have been stored, to reboot digestive function, to give you a level of inner balance with nature, which means your circadian rhythms are, are in sync. So then you can have a level of clarity here to see clearly patterns of behavior that are real and ones that are not real based on needing approval and appreciation from others versus feeling safe enough to let the truth of you out, the delicate petals of your, of your true self out. That's what Ayurveda is really about. So if you choose to do an Ayurveda cleanse with us this year, um, whether it be our Colorado cleanse, which is our big 14-day cleanse, which is, a, you know, um, it's an it's a amazing experience, you know, because it gives you the time to really drop in. And you can still work during these cleanses, but whenever, but you don't want to add on or schedule extra stuff. You want to deschedule yourself. Take time to just try to dial it down a little bit if you can, and then go from and then go from there. You know, so give yourself permission to kind of rest and don't exercise as hard. You can still go for walks. You can still do a little exercise, but during the actual seven days of the ghee, we really ask you to really give your body a chance to get some rest. And do the and do the best you can. And the more that you rest, like what happened to me in my two-week experience, the more yoga, breathing, meditation you do, which I give you those tools as well, the more powerful the result. <clears throat> Pulling back the bow, giving yourself the rest. That's the key. Not how intense you are about getting the kitchery just right, or doing the green drinks, or doing the sipping in the hot water, or the beet salad, or all those. It's more importantly about finding your own rhythm, being comfortable with it. Use your own intuition, you know you know about how much you should do and how much how, how little you should do we do give you plenty of guidance about how to dial it up or dial it down if you feel like you need a little you can do a little more we give you you know tools for for doing that as well you know the key you know it's sort of like um, you know being compassionate for your own self you know realizing that this is my cleanse and I'm doing it for myself and I want to find that rhythm that suits me. So the idea that these cleanses are designed for you to find your rhythm. Don't feel like you need to go extreme or be a perfectionist to get the benefits. You don't. You want to get the benefits more? Pull back the bow. That means hold yourself really still. Be calm. Become more still. And if from that silence, you can begin to start taking action. And that is the perfect thing. That is such a beautiful experience when you begin to start taking yourself back into activity but you feel this inner peace about you. You feel this no overwhelm sense, this ability that you can do anything and you can handle any stress, like there's nothing you can't do. That is what you get when you pull back the bow and you start to live an Ayurvedic lifestyle. But not an Ayurvedic lifestyle that's full of little things that you have to do every day and you start feeling guilty because you're not doing them. That's not gonna get you where you need to go. You gotta give yourself permission to do what you are, where you are right now. Okay, so, the, the, the last thing I want to wrap up with, I want to give you just a, a taste of what the goal might look like. Ayurveda says that the goal of life, uh, the goal of Ayurveda, is what's called the Purush Arthas. And um, the Purush Arthas are, um, you know, really um, the purpose of your life. And um, there's four aspects of your life. And the first one is called Kala, which means pleasure or joy. So, you know, the, the, one of the main goals of life is to enjoy life. It's important. So while you're doing a cleanse, we want to make sure that you're enjoying this. And if you're just pushing the edge of the envelope and stretching that rubber band, it's not going to be enjoyable. And when you give yourself a little bit more slack, you get to enjoy the process. You also get to begin to enjoy the truth of you, which is that feeling of comfort and calm, inner silence and safety to let yourself out and connect with others on that deeper level, that eudaimonic hedonistic study I mentioned, when you're feeling safe and connecting with people and pleasure without needing anything in return, you're definitely experiencing kala. The truth, the, the, the true aspect of pleasure is to connect 
at a real deep heart-to-heart -heart level. And you do that when you don't want anything in return. The next goal of life, Purush Artha, is actually called Artha, which means wealth. And wealth in Ayurveda was like, yeah, you need to put you know, food on the table for your family, you need to protect them, give them a roof over their head. But you also need to realize that as you gain more wealth in your life, you can't be attached to the fruits of your actions. Um, that's a critical piece of the Ayurvedic puzzle. So as you gain more things, you have to constantly remember, how can I not be attached to these things? And that's done by, you know, oftentimes giving and being more charitable and caring for others in ways that actually fills you up because it's when you give, you feel more connected. That's what we call in Ayurveda sattva. And when you care and love and can support others, your, your, your whole nervous system becomes sattvic. And we know when that happens, the longevity hormone oxytocin increases. We know the length of your telomeres, uh, which are linked to longevity, lengthen. We know that the, the, the good bugs in your gut proliferate in a, in a major way. Um, so there's a lot of things that happen when you, when you choose to give as opposed to figure out how to get, right? And that means you know, giving but not being attached to the fruits, which means you're holding on to all your gold and all your treasure before you pass away. And then finally, there's Dharma. Dharma is not your, your life's purpose or your occupation or your job. Dharma means the laws of nature, living in sync with the natural laws of nature. Now we're raising the vibration up a little bit. We're asking you to become aware of the laws of nature, truth, integrity, honesty, living in rhythm with the natural cycles, going downstream with the current, living a seasonal lifestyle, changing the food seasonally, being up with the sun, going to bed with the sun, or shortly thereafter. But being there with the rhythms of nature are incredibly powerful. And following the, the behavioral Versailles is honor and integrity and being truthful. Because just to get more stuff and lie, cheat, and steal to get more stuff, God, that is such a violation of what we're really here to do, right? Um, so that's kind of the, the beauty of, of Dharma. Dharma is I've aligned myself with what I know to be true, and I think we all do know what's to be true. We don't oftentimes share that. Um, we just pretend we're doing good, but we know we're doing wrong. And that's something that uh, when you're really honest with yourself uh, at the end of the day, only you know, and that's where we get to make the change. But when you have clarity and your body's in balance and you've detoxified, you're in that place where you can really make those transformational changes, see truth from non-truth and take action based on what's real. And finally is moksha. Moksha is enlightenment. Moksha means, means that you, you've, you're not attached to the outcome. You're free from all the desires and needs and you're above the fray. And I think that's the beauty of Ayurveda, you know, in the last third of our life, they call it the vata time of life, where the nervous system becomes more refined and more self-aware. It's air-based, it's, it's, it's space or kasha-based. It vibrates at a much higher level. So as we age, we don't get old and decrepit, we get more self-aware. Our vibration is wired, we're hardwired to be able to perceive and experience subtle energy at a more high frequency. And therefore, choose higher frequency experiences as opposed to you know, things that might be gross or violent. We start wanting and appreciating things that are of higher vibration. And we start to vibrate on that level because at the end of the day, it's, it's the Prush Arthas are for the journey or for the purpose of the soul. Prush is soul, Artha is for the purpose of. So all these four purposes or goals of life are really for the purpose of your soul. And your soul is the one part of us that is Immortal. It is never going to die if you if you believe in afterlife or believe in soul or spiritual in any way. That's the one kind of kind of rule that seems to transcend almost all religions is that we have this soul that seems to continue, and that part of us is here now and it's going to be here after this physical body dies off. So Ayurveda was like, we don't have to have this complete lack of awareness of our soul that we can become a realized passenger on the journey of the soul. We can do that by practicing these Ayurvedic principles, by letting the truth of you out, cleaning, cleansing, rebuilding, rejuvenating along the way, taking action that are, that are not for you but for others and caring for others. And all of a sudden, you begin to start to function 
And doing the yoga and the breathing and the meditation, which are hardwired and scientifically proven to, to amp, amp up neuroplasticity and literally change the brainwave frequency of your brain. There's just great science behind that. Um, so all that's designed to do that, you know, and it's a long life, but you want to be, you know, and you're going to go up and down along the way. But at the end of the day, when you're in your 60s and 70s and 80s, you want to have that level of mental clarity and awareness where you are, are not craving all the old dumb things you did in your 20s and 30s and 40s, you know, that you really found a deep, deep level of peace, a deep, deep level of connection. And that's um, where we're coming from at Lifespots, what we're trying to teach. So, you know, in this, less, in this kind of podcast, I want to leave with you just that one final notion again is that if you decide to do a cleanse with us, you know, give yourself permission to take it easy and do, do it your way and mold it in a way that fits you and don't feel so stressed if you don't get it just right. Because that stressed out version of you is actually going to undermine the, undermine the underlying purpose of why we do these cleanses in the first place. All right, hope you join us for a cleanse. You did the short home cleanse. Remember, that's a free ebook. The Colorado cleanse is on sale now. We do that once, a, twice a year as a group, so everybody gets to do it together. We have online uh, 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 groups, chat rooms where people talk. I give question and answer sessions throughout the entire cleanse to make sure people feel really connected and they have really great support. So we have the group cleanses where you have tons of support. We hold your hand and guide you through the process. Um, and then the Colorado, and then the short home cleanse was just our four day cleanse. Those, all those kits are on sale now, so please check them out at lifespa.com. Thanks for listening. I'm Dr. John Duyard. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by LifeSpa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at LifeSpa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.